Is solid leadership a thing of the past? Is there still value in compromise? We'll talk to Pam Iorio, the former mayor of Tampa and author of Straightforward Ways to Live and Lead, next on UCF Metro Center Outlook. This program is made possible by funding from the UCF Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies, where government leaders, business executives, and academic experts come together to discuss major issues facing the state of Florida. Hello everyone, welcome to UCF Metro Center Outlook. I'm Diane Trees, director of the UCF Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies and your host for Metro Center Outlook. Pam Iorio drew from three decades of experience in business and public service for her book Straightforward, which offers strategies for effective, pragmatic leadership. Today we'll chat with the former mayor of the city of Tampa about partisan politics, women in leadership, and her time as mayor. Pam, welcome to the show today. Great to be here. You served as a Hillsborough County Commissioner at the age of 26. What inspired you to get involved in politics, especially at such an early age? You know, I did start young uh, because when I was very, very young, even in elementary school, I used to read biographies and read every biography in the library. And you know what the theme is when you read the stories of, of, of Americans and Americans who have achieved great things? Is that in our country, they all start off as ordinary people in many cases even people from impoverished backgrounds who really wanted to make a difference and whose lives were lives of accomplishments and leaving a legacy and when I was a little girl I remember reading these biographies and thinking that's kind of the story of our country and if all of these people can make a difference maybe public service is for me too and that's where my inspiration came from from a very early age so I was very fortunate that I had the opportunity in my early 20s and, um, and that the voters gave me yes. an opportunity to serve. That was the important thing. Well, that follows through with your book, Straightforward Ways to Live and Lead. Why did you write the book? Well, as I was finishing up my second term as mayor of the city of Tampa, uh, I was assessing what to do next and I thought, you know, I really need to become a leadership speaker and help people become better and stronger leaders because we need it. Need it. Let's face it, this country is in a fix right now. Um, our political leadership is lacking. It's a very polarized situation, highly partisan, highly ideological. There's not enough of the middle ground where most of the answers are. Uh, even in business, I've seen examples of very poor leadership. We can look to the financial um, uh, travesty that occurred some years ago in our country and Wall Street and, and really very poor business leadership that allowed this to happen and no one really stepping up to take responsibility. And even as mayor, we funded a whole host of nonprofits. And many times I would look at the leadership of some of the nonprofits and thought, you know, these people are, are some people are running very important institutions, but they seem to lack some very basic leadership qualities. So I set out in my book and through my leadership speaking to help people understand some of the basic tenets of leadership and how they need to develop the leader within themselves and that becoming a good, strong, effective, straightforward leader means that you're always a work in progress and you need to recognize that. You focus though on problem solving strategies and um, characteristics for leadership, almost to the exclusion of ideology. Mm -hmm. Was that your intent and in, in the way you wanted the book to be? Absolutely. You know, when I left office, many people would say to me, um, even though they had followed my political career throughout its 26 years, they would often come up to me and say, Mayor, I don't even know what party you're affiliated with. And I thought, good. You know why? Because it's about solving problems. It's about transportation issues and budgetary issues and providing a good life for people so that they can look to government as a provider of essential services and doing it in an efficient and, and uh, effective way. Uh, so you don't want that to be about ideology. But today we um, have really gotten to the point where our problem st solving is stymied by ideology and partisanship. I talk in my book a bit about abuse of power and how you can really tell a lot about a person and how they handle power. Um, well, the problem, of course, on the federal level and even at the state level is that it's so highly partisan that it becomes a distortion of, of the use of power. People have to fall in line with the party 
or they don't uh, get reap other benefits of whatever their position There's consequences has. There are consequences. And uh, consequently, you don't have people who are doing the right thing for the right reasons. Instead, you have kind of a get-along mentality. And uh, we see this with our, in, uh, in our state politics. And you get bad legislation for bad reasons. And, and, and you have legislation that's not really addressing uh, the problems that Floridians are facing. And you certainly don't have people in Washington addressing our financial problems, which are severe and need compromise in order to solve. You said in the book that a large segment of the American population, the middle ground people, not the far right or the far left, these people are so disenchanted that a lot of them have given up. How do we get these people re-engaged and to step forward for the leadership roles? You know, I'm a flaming moderate and I think a lot of other people are too. I think the vast majority of Americans fall in the middle. Um, and, but here's the problem. The vast majority of Americans don't vote in primary elections. We are witnessing this right now with the Republican primary season. I spent 10 years as a supervisor of elections, so I, I know a little bit about you know voting the patterns. You know very well. And, you know, you're, at the most, you're probably going to get 25% participate in a primary election. So then you come to the general, and then people look at those options. And, of course, because we have a closed primary system in Florida, the independents don't even vote. Um, and, and so the moderates are left with choices that sometimes they're not happy with. And then people say, well, how come they're not enthused about the candidates? Well, the candidates were selected through a very partisan, I, highly ideological process. Most people are moderates. I found as mayor that most answers were in the middle. You know, whenever you'd have a room full of people, and even if passions were really high on an issue, whatever the issue was, by the time the meeting ended, and you let each side vent what their uh, passions were all about, and then you got down to real problem solving. In 90% of all cases, the answer was somewhere in the middle. Well, that's what you said. One of the attributes, two attributes, actually, one surprised me, humility mm -hmm. is not necessarily something you associate with leadership. The other thing that you kept saying in the book, compromise, and that was so essential, and what you found in your term. You know, look at the beginnings of our country. We all always look to the founding fathers of men of great brilliance and foresight, and they were. We were very fortunate as a nation to have that particular grouping of individuals at that time to form the basic documents that laid the groundwork for our great nation. So you would say, well, they were all people of strong opinions, right? They were all people who felt had you know, strongly held views and passionate about liberty and, and about how the country should be shaped. But you know what? They were willing to compromise on a fundamental issue of slavery, which really was a moral issue. But they did it so the country could be formed. Without that compromise on slavery, we never would have become the United States of America. The Constitution would not have passed. The moral and so, economic issues involved were immense. Immense. And so you look at that and you say, now, wait a minute. Our founding fathers, although it, imperfect, to say the least, and it was an imperfect compromise, but a compromise nonetheless that allowed our nation to move forward. And then 70 years later, we had to resolve that issue through a civil war. But you look at that and you say, these great men were, were, were able to reach a compromise on this moral issue. And yet today we can't compromise on issues of debt. We can't compromise on issues of revenue sources. We can't compromise on issues of entitlement programs. Well, there's just no comparison between the two. We, we lack that greatness. We, we lack, lack that greatness. Right. We lack the ability, the, the bridge builders we are sorely needed to find to, to help both parties come together. Compromise is a sign of strength. It is in your marriage. Anyone listening who, who is married or has a partnership of any kind knows that uh, your ability to give and take and compromise so that that relationship can grow and flourish and blossom over the years, that shows strength, not weakness. Let's talk a little bit about your time as mayor. You served two terms before you were term limited out. Right. What weighed most heavily on you holding that position? Well, uh, the most um, heart-wrenching times for me uh, was the death of police officers killed in the line of duty. 
and that happened four times during my eight years. And the very first one was Juan Serrano, who had been assigned to me uh, for to be with me every day, for lack of a better term, I'll say bodyguard. Uh, he and I had become very close friends, and um, and he was with me every day. And he dropped me off one day after an event, and on his way home, he was killed by a drunk driver. Um, and then we lost another officer, uh, Mike Roberts, in 09, and two officers in 2010, officers Curtis and Cocab. Those were by far the most difficult times uh, emotionally for me. Um, as mayor, you feel uh, very much part of the law enforcement police family. Uh, you I felt that we were sending our police officers out on a mission every day to make our city safer, and they did it. I mean, in, in eight years, our crime rate dropped 61 and a half percent. Tampa is one of the safest cities of its size uh, in the country now. Well, and that's one of the things I think that you are most proud of um, with your, your two terms as mayor. The police officers just did an outstanding job. So, of course, the deaths hit me very hard and, and still something that I think about all the time. Um, in my second term, we had to strategically shrink city government and make it s a smaller, not on a temporary basis, but I think this is going to be the norm for local governments going forward because this revenue loss for local governments is not temporary. And, and that's something that is often misunderstood for, um, for several reasons. It is something that is long-term in nature. And so that was very difficult. It had to be done but still you're adversely affecting people's lives and that's not something that I like to do. Well, you talk in the book about the difference on the two terms that you served, yeah. one being in the boom times, turning around to the type and length of recession that we've had. How did your governing style change for the city? My first term was uh, the boom times and it's all about the new ideas, new initiatives, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and we addressed everything from crime to the arts district, uh, the river walk, to storm water, to Beautiful pipes. park. The park, the Curtis Dixon Waterfront Park, museum, so everything was about, you know, progress and building. And so then comes the second term and it's this great recession. And it's different, but you know what? Even though the second term was mostly consumed with how do we strategically shrink city government, throughout the eight years we held firm to our six strategic goals. And in the book I talk about how important it is for leaders to have goals, that you need to chart a course, and that course has to be clear. And we never wavered from our strategic goals, and after eight years we had a lot to show for it because of that. So whether you're in boom times or whether you're in recessionary times, it's very important that you look at your long-term strategic goals and continue to make progress. And you know what? You can make progress even when times are tough. Another thing you talk about in the book is the importance of having a mentor, and yeah. especially one that can become a personal friend to tell you the truth when you might not want to hear it. How difficult is it for women in politics to cultivate that kind of relationship? You know, be open to people. Um, I, I have described in my book a mentor and a close dear friend that I have and have had for 29 years now, and she helped guide my political life. But I also talk in the book about my chance meeting with Margaret Thatcher, for example, and when I was a student in London. You have to be open and, and you know, seek out relationships. You, you know, if I hadn't been open that day in London, I would never have met Margaret amazing. Thatcher. <laughs> And, you know, young people, and I have had some young women reach out to me over the years, and I always appreciate the fact that they are willing to reach out, and then you have to, you have to return that, though. As a, when you be achieve some level of success, you have to give back and help bring others up. And that's a reason why you wrote the book, I think, too. It is, because I really want people to read that book and see how they can develop stronger leadership characteristics and see that leadership within, and it doesn't always come from a title. You and I were discussing this before the program started. We all know people with titles, and then they're not very good leaders, are they? No. And then we know a whole bunch of people who don't have any titles, but they are great leaders. They lead their family well, they lead in their community, they're great volunteer leaders, they might be the coach of the little league team, they might help at their church or temple, wherever their place of uh, spiritual worship, it, we know people in all walks of life that a title is not needed for them to be great leaders. 
You also talk, though, about a number of places in the book of mistakes that you made. Mm -hmm. How did those mistakes influence your ideas then for leadership? You're well, very candid about it in the book. I am because I've made a lot of mistakes, and, um, and there's nothing wrong with saying that. I think the key is don't make the same mistake twice. And, uh, you know, towards the end of my time in, as mayor, I made fewer than I did in the beginning because, of course, in the beginning, you know, you're, you're a CEO of a really large city, and, of course, in the beginning, you're going to make a few more. But still, you make mistakes. And I think it's very important to um, continue to grow as a leader, to be honest with yourself, not only about your strengths, but about your weaknesses. Sometimes when people get to a certain point in their life, a certain age, um, and they've achieved a certain amount of success, they quit looking at their weaknesses. You know, they think, well, I'm a success. I'm the head of such and such. I, whatever weaknesses I've had, that's, that's obviously I hasn't reached affected. reached that point yet. <laughs> no, well, that shows that you are a person who is constantly sees yourself as a work in progress, so you are constantly becoming a better leader. When I meet someone, and I met someone just the other day in a speech I gave who um, was so sure of themselves and had just pretty much announced to me that he had conquered any weaknesses he ever had and he was just the best that could possibly be, I thought to myself, no, that's not a good sign. Um, you know, you want a person who is constantly assessing and saying, you know what, I've been introspective with myself, I have fallen short, and I need to improve. That's the sign of a great leader. Some of the things, though, are out of your control. Yeah. You have McDill Air Force Base in mm -hmm. the Tampa Bay area, a key element for the economy, second largest employer, $6 billion a year back into the local economy. How vulnerable is McDill for the upcoming BRAC reviews? And I know you faced that before. We have faced that a couple times in Tampa's history, and I really think that McDill is in, on very solid ground uh, because the, the government, the military, has continued to invest in McDill with infrastructure. And the infrastructure that's been placed there, not only in residential, but in um, really hard facilities, technological f facilities there, I think speaks to what the Air Force sees as um, continued viability and growth of MGDL Air Force Base. That's a tremendous asset that we have. We have a large military presence here in Central Florida Research Park. Might there be a way for regionally to uh, combat more effectively some of these base closure issues or the defense cuts? I don't know if that's a possibility, but with both areas having the military like that. Right. I, I don't know if that's the case between this, that particular synergy there. Um, I will say that, you know, in my time as mayor, we worked very closely with Orlando to build this concept of a super region. And, of course, we were looking forward to the high-speed rail coming. Yes. And that, You're a long-time adv advocate I have been of an advocate transit. not only of high-speed rail, but I've been an advocate of light rail within communities and better bus systems because what Florida really lacks is a modern 21st century transportation system. And uh, the high-speed rail was a real opportunity to connect two vibrant regions into a super region. With and both of us developing medical simulation centers. You got it. The, the synergy between the two. We're you said, though, that communication you felt was a key factor in, in failure for projects like that. Right, not the high speed rail, which was the killed by rail. Governor Scott uh, unilaterally, but I'm talking about the, the. Now, when you talk about light rail, we had a referendum in Hillsborough County, which did not fare well. And in my book, I talk about how with communication today, we live in an age of an extensive amount of information all the time, and we get it from our smartphones to everything from the moment we wake up. But it is so important that communication be simple and something that's very easy to describe. We made an error with our referendum in that it became a very complex, big ticketed item that was very hard to explain. Um, one thing I've learned in three decades of being in public life is the importance of being able to explain something in a way that people can grasp it in just a paragraph or two. And that's why you had six strategic goals as mayor and not 20 exactly. that no one would remember. You can only have, and maybe even six was too many, but we did have six. Sometimes three would probably be the best number. Uh, but I repeated those strategic goals over and over again over six, over eight years. 
Uh, and, and so then they become very clear in the voters' minds that this is what your administration is all about. And then they can even repeat to other people where their city is headed. And that's when you know you really have achieved success in communication. You talked before about writing the book. You said that it was the most difficult thing that you have ever done. And you've done a lot of difficult things. Why was it so hard? It flowed very well. Well, because I'm an extrovert and I really get my energy from uh, being out with people. And I had just come off of being mayor where it's all about people. I mean, when you're mayor, it's a, it's, you know, every day is people, people, people. And then I was no longer mayor and it was me and my computer screen. And, and writing is a very insular, introverted activity. And anyone listening who's a writer is, is, is nodding their head right now because they know exactly what I'm talking about. You wrote a dissertation. You know that is not an extroverted activity, no, right? It's not. <laughs> okay, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And for me, it was very difficult. And, and also, I couldn't, I had to find my voice. You know, it's just like when you're first mayor, you have to find your voice. You, you might be sworn in one day, but it doesn't mean that you have the voice of the mayor the next day. You have to develop that voice. And I had to go through a few versions of the book before I finally settled on my voice, something that sounded like me. And um, it took a while. It was the most difficult thing I've ever done because I've never done it before. And no matter what age you're at and no matter what you've achieved in the past, whenever you go off and do something new, it's a new it's challenge. A it's thing. a growth experience. And um, looking back, I'm really glad I did it. It was good for me. You know, when you were mayor, you left office with an 87% approval rating. So I think that you carried through that success with the book. It, it's very interesting. Thanks. Former U.S. Senator Bob Graham has named you as a strong statewide Democratic candidate for the future. How does it feel to get recognition like that? especially from someone I know that you admire him a great deal. You know, it's really a great compliment coming from uh, Governor and Senator Bob Graham because I do admire him. In fact, I mentioned him in the book as an example of a person of substance because so often in politics we just don't have enough people of substance who really know what they're talking about, who have that great intellectual capacity and the ability to effectively communicate ideas to the public. And Governor Graham has all of that, so I thank him for that compliment, and uh, he's been a good role model for me in politics. A possible future political office for you? It's hard to say. You know, I'm too young to say no to anything. At least I feel like I'm too young to say no. And right now I'm a leadership speaker, and I enjoy that very much. And I'm enjoying, you know, getting my book out and the message about leadership out to people and helping people see the leadership that they have within themselves and become better, stronger leaders. Thank you. It's a, it's a very good book. It's been a pleasure meeting you. I've enjoyed it so much. Thanks. I've been talking with Pam Iorio, the former mayor of Tampa, about her book Straightforward, which offers actionable strategies for becoming a better leader. Thank you for tuning in to UCF Metro Center Outlook. Until next time, I'm Diane Trees. This program is made possible by funding from the UCF Metropolitan Center for Regional Studies, where government leaders, business executives, and academic experts come together to discuss major issues facing the state of Florida.